<laughs> Macaulay, you look so serious. <laughs> so, welcome to Lesson 15, Quantum Internet. Up until this point, I've been behind the camera instead of in front of it, but we thought we'd do this last lesson together. So, what is the Quantum Internet? I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> let's find out. Let's begin with step one, network of networks. Now, this is a combination of words that you've been hearing quite a lot throughout this module. And here we will give you a slightly more concrete idea of what it really means. So first off, right, the internet is this really complicated thing. And there are a whole bunch of individual networks and a whole bunch of individual nodes that make this up. So it's a network of networks. So let's see a little bit about how that works. Let's see. Assume you want to start in the upper left-hand corner up there. Your home network is this blue network, and you want to connect to some service that's out on the green network, and you have to get there through this series of pink networks. Mikhail, how are we going to get there? Well, we don't actually know. Because we are on the blue networks, we just tell the internet, get us there, and magically it happens. Okay. So let's see. So what happens next? We're, we've got this path that we've sketched out mm. here on, on this arbitrary sort of network here. But the reality is that you're connected to one network and your traffic is going to go from your current location to what's called a gateway to, to the outside world. And then from there, it's going to hop across some other networks to get to where it wants to be. Right? But in order to, to make the whole system work, you don't know anything about the inside of those other networks. You only know about the blue network. So, the other networks here, they are all opaque to the users that are outside, and this provides you with scalability, privacy, and autonomy as a network operator. So, scalability, you know, otherwise, how are we going to get to billions and billions of nodes on this? You can't. True. You can't have every single node on the network know everything about every other node on the entire network. It doesn't. It's. Mm. It can't scale it that way. But it's also true that the people who own networks want to be able to evolve what's inside the network mm. at their own rate, using potentially their own choices of technology and mm. um, changing what's going on on the inside. And they don't want to share that information outside for for business reasons or for privacy reasons, you know, for competitive advantage reasons, or whatever. And this gives us a, a certain amount of autonomy. Mm -hmm. right? So in this network, you'll see there are you know, your network, the blue one, and you have to know how to get across your network to that gateway. And then the gateway has to know which network to send things to next. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to know anything about the inside of those. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see what's next. So. Well, let's have a uh, look where the classical internet is right now. As of March of 2021, where this was recorded, there's around 71,000 autonomous systems. So what's Rob, an autonomous system? I was going to ask the same question. OK. So an autonomous system is one of those networks that was on our previous slide, mm -hmm. one of the pink ones, or one of the blue ones, or one of the green ones. Um, roughly, you can think of an autonomous system, or an AS, as corresponding to an organization. Mm -hmm. So you know, KO University would have one network. It's one autonomous system. The WIDE project would have one network that's one autonomous system. And the routing protocol then knows which network to go to next, which one of these autonomous systems okay. to go to next. So there's around 870,000 IPv4 routing table entries. What does, what does that actually mean? Can you put that into perspective? <laughs> it sounds like a large number, but what really does it mean? It does. So what it means is there are 870,000 relationships between pairs of networks out of those 71,000 networks above mm -hmm. there. So roughly, so you know, um, 12 or 14 connections per network. So on mm -hmm. average, each one of those networks, one of the pink ones or blue ones or green ones we had before, each one of those on average is going to be connected to about a dozen other networks mm -hmm. at places that are called internet exchange points. Right. Um, so collectively, each one of those, they show up in the overall structure for 
routing across the entire planet and that entire set of routes is how you figure out how to get from your own network to whatever service you're trying to connect to somewhere on the other side of the planet. You know what that reminds me of? What? Of the previous animation that we had of the completely connected graph, mm -hmm. where we said it doesn't make sense to just connect all of the, all of the nodes to all of the other possible nodes in, uh, in, in the network. Same in here, you, just see, you said there's exactly. around 12 to 14 connections between the autonomous systems. It's the same logic, right? Yeah, so actually, if you took that whole 71,000, what's 71,000 squared divided by two? That would be 49 mm -hmm. times 10 to the eight, that would be you know, five billion entries or, you know, divided by two. So it'd be two mm -hmm. and a half billion entries or something instead of, an, instead of about a million. If every network, directly was capable of exchanging traffic with it with every other network mm. but the reality is that they don't right um, now the whole evolution of how the internet got this way and how many of these networks there are and the organization of them which ones connect to each other's a lot of that comes from you know, historical business relationships and the like and the quantum internet will probably evolve in a very different fashion but this same general idea of having networks that are owned and operated by an organization mm. and they connect to other networks, that same idea is going to stay. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that. I mean, developing quantum technology is a very expensive business. So you don't want to just give access to anybody to everything that you have spent so much money in developing and researching. Yeah. Well, and so the, uh, and the, the next point right here. So there are already billions of nodes connected to the network. We talked about that in one of the earlier yeah. steps. Um, computers and mobile phones and IoT devices, and there is no central node registry, so the true number of these things isn't known. Um, so if you run a network, you can put more devices on the network mm. subject to you know, certain constraints. You know, do, do you have the ability to give them addresses and, and send their traffic out to places and things like that? But this general idea really holds for, for that, um, as opposed to the phone system, mm. where there is a central authority that gives out phone numbers. And so there's somebody who could actually count all of the phone numbers and tell you where they are, and you mm -hmm. can figure out how many phones there are. But with the internet, who knows how many devices are actually mm -hmm. are connected to it. And it's because of the autonomy provided by, by that, that, uh, that system where each of the individual networks is allowed to control what goes on inside of its own network. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a very, very clever system. It must have taken quite some time to develop <laughs> the system, no? Well, you know, half a century or so since, since, the, since the earliest uh, ARPANET experiments. But let's see. So when did this real sort of system of uh, autonomous networks and other protocols, including, so one of the things that's mentioned here on the slide that we haven't mentioned yet is BGP. That's the Border Gateway Protocol. Mm -hmm. And that is the protocol that, that exchanges this information about the relationships between those networks. Um, when did all of that develop? Well, you know, the, uh, I'd have to go back and, and look mm. to be sure, but uh, the late 80s and early 90s is pretty much when, right. when this structure was laid out. So where do you think uh, the quantum internet is in relation to classical oh, internet? We're, we're still decades and decades away from, get, from, right. from reaching this kind of scale, but we want to apply what we have learned over the last half mm. century in the process of developing the classical internet and use that knowledge to actually design and develop the quantum internet as we go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, so one of the other topics that we haven't talked about yet, uh, that's a big trend in classical information system structures in, or systems in general, including both the internet and how computing systems and work, not, and what, work and whatnot, is uh, virtualization. So virtualization, in the process of virtualization, a, uh, a computer or even a network might not, not correspond exactly to a single physical system. Mm -hmm. So you might have a virtual server that's really a collection of software and data that you think is running on a particular piece of hardware, but it might not actually be running here. It might be all running over there instead somewhere mm -hmm. else. So it might pretend to be at the top part of that network, but it might really be somewhere uh, down lower. And um, there are a lot of mechanisms built into the classical internet to make that virtualization possible so that services can appear in multiple places and, mm -hmm. and the copies of them can be in different places. And that allows the services to kind of migrate around. Right. Um, and this virtualization brings a lot of benefits. Um, we're still a long ways away from wanting something like that virtualization for, for the, the quantum internet, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe eventually we'll get there. Mm -hmm. But a related concept is recursion. 
Oh, recursion? I know. I remember from my computing classes. So we, we, said, we said that the internet is a network of things, where every network can be thought of as a single node of some other la different layer of a network. Is that what recursion is in yeah. the context of networks? So in the, uh, that earlier figure that we had with the blue network mm -hmm. and four or five uh, pink networks and a green network, each one of those inside has a structure, but, the, but we can also talk about the graph that connects each of those. And so you can think of that, about that as the recursion mm -hmm. in the system. So the BGP system that I was talking about a minute ago is essentially two layers or two tiers. There's the internal and the external protocol for connecting it. And so the internal is for how do you get around inside of your own network. Mm. Um, and you actually have the choice to actually use a different protocol or a different algorithm for routing inside your network as long as you can meet, can meet your um, contractual obligations with others to exchange information with them and to carry your traffic back and forth across your network in some reasonable way. But then there's the external BGP, and that's the graph of the relationship between the, those autonomous systems, the, mm -hmm. the internet level total um, architecture between the whole thing. So that's mm -hmm. two levels. But the reality is that in most modern local area networks, there's actually another sort of routing system that's built into local area networks as well. Mm -hmm. So we've already got three layers. Mm -hmm. Conceptually, this, this process could actually be repeated indefinitely, and we can build what's called a recursive network. Kind of like this, right? Yeah. Where each node is really a different network. Yeah. So each one of these individual nodes might be a network inside of it. And mm -hmm. then inside of that, each one of those nodes might in turn be a network inside of that. And so conceptually, at least, it could go to sort of arbitrary depth in, in this. And again, that gets us scalability in, uh, in uh, what we're actually building. And it allows us to reuse mm -hmm. a lot of the mechanisms that we're designing and building at the level of um, you know, the global internet and then some wide area network and then some organizational network and then some local area network and then possibly even on down even inside the individual machines you can actually use mm -hmm. similar techniques and sometimes not often but sometimes um, you'll actually have a, uh, a virtual network inside of your actual own machine that actually re reuses some of those concepts inside and there's no reason why it can't can, why that process can't just continue very cool. Yeah. All right, so that concludes the first step. Let's see what awaits us in the next step.